Hello everyone, welcome to the Christian Humanist. I'm Damien. The topic for today is why men choose to be chaste, or why men choose a chaste way of life. So this video is basically a follow-up to the previous one, and it's part uh, four now in the problem with chastity and virginity. In the previous video, we engaged the topic of virginity, uh, specifically on the standpoint of women. Well, as I argued, I mean, virginity really is a female concept. It really makes little sense to attach that idea to men, although technically, technically you could. But uh, yeah, I think chastity as a concept seems more applicable to men. Of course, at some point, maybe we'll look at both concepts uh, in an integrated way as far as both sexes are concerned. But for our discussion today, we will look at the problem with chastity for men, or, and more specifically, why men choose to be chaste, okay? So going back to the previous video, I, I won't keep referring to it. I encourage you all to watch the video. Uh, but this point I will make is that we learned that uh, when it comes to things like chastity and virginity, is that a lot of the uh, life style choices, okay, the choices that we would make at a moral level, at a personal level, okay, are not specifically or not purely derived from the teachings themselves, right? We just say that it's not that people are doing these things because of the teachings, it's not that they're not doing it purely because they've been taught these things, they're not doing these things just because they were, you know, raised in an environment which emphasized these values, although those are variables and those are valid considerations. However, there are other factors, other motivating factors, other psychosocial factors, other personal attitudinal elements which work into this equation, okay? In other words, why a person chooses a way of life which negates the chances of them, you know, losing their virginity or in this case, uh, being chased, okay? In other words, not having opportunities to have, well, basically premarital uh, sex. Again, I'm not talking about, you know, mar marriage folks, that's an issue. That's a different matter altogether. I'm talking about, you know, premarital relationships, right? That's our consideration here. So specifically, what is making men uh, what is compelling men or what is uh, contributing to men's inability to have sex okay and i'm looking at this looking at this from a christian perspective so in other words i'm looking at it from the standpoint of say in this case people who choose to be chaste okay, who choose a chaste way of life you know who choose to you know remain faithful to their you know future spouse whether that's their current partner who they may or may not marry or someone they may or may not meet in the future so folks the fact is you really cannot say you know how these things may or may, may or may not work out but the point is the idea of chastity is, is assumes that you are living for the sake of someone or an i one person okay because in christianity technically you're only supposed to sleep with your wife uh, and you're only supposed to leave it there for the sake of getting uh, impregnated. Okay, that's sort of an extreme version, but really that's the core dogma anyway. So in our case, we're looking at the problem of why men are chaste, okay? <laughs> why men choose to lead a ch chaste way of life, critically in relation to the Christian worldview. So now, before we get to the Christian qu question, again, again, looking at the underlying factors, we need to look at what chastity, is, chastity means in practice. Okay, What does it mean for a guy to be chaste? Okay, What does that imply? Now, going back to the point about you know women and their sexuality and how that works, Okay, we know, or we ought to know, is that it's technically are the passive one okay women are you know they're basically receivers okay they're basically they stand at the receiving end of things okay and we men give it to them okay and again there's another way to put them put this folks i mean as true as it is in a relational sense in a physiological sense in the act itself okay you know, women technically and i think in reality are the receivers okay not just when it comes to the act itself but really the whole relational framework okay i mean going back to i mean let's just say how how does a relationship you know manifest how does the intimacy work how does it you know, come, how does it, you know, materialize? Let's put it that way. Okay, it involves action. It involves a sequence of steps that leads from A to X, okay, or sex, okay. Uh, you know, from, you know, you meeting a girl, you speaking to her, you know, you, you know, you know exchanging, you know, pleasantries, getting to know the person to whatever extent, you know, forming some kind of connection, okay, or, or a deeper connection. And then taking it, uh, taking things from there. Of course, it works out differently. It plays out differently. You know, it could mean various things in various uh, times. The relationships work are complex by nature. You know, it could happen on the same day. It could happen in a week from now, a month from now, or maybe years from now. We don't know. Okay. And of course, it depends on the meetup itself. You know, why you're meeting the person. It could be on Tinder. It could be on another dating app. It could be on something that's more commitment oriented. It could be something that's less commitment oriented. Hence, you know, the many, many factors that work into it. But critically, yeah, the critical consideration for us is that relationships, particularly when it comes to intimacy or that which leads to intimacy, is really our area of operation. It's really up to us guys to make it happen. Okay. You know, women tech are just going to, you know, are passive receivers. Okay. It's us up to us men to uh, help women or make women, you know, want to have sex with us. There's no other way to put it. Now, I mean, of course, in the fantasy world, in, in the pornographic world, in the in the, uh, you know, the red light raunch culture world, that's different, okay, because there people employ financial incentives. Of course, we do we do that as well indirectly, like, you know, asking her out on a date technically is a form of incentivization, right? You're, you're buying her a drink, you're buying her something, or, you know, going to a nice, you know, movie or maybe something more fancy later on, fancy dinner or maybe a nice uh, park, whatever, or a nice uh, dance, whatever. But in those instances, you're communicating value. You're trying to say, hey, look, I'm a guy who, who's worth dating, who's worth going out with, and at some point, sleeping with, okay? So we as men are the one who are driving the, the narrative, are driving the process, okay? 
and girls just have to you know just play along really i mean they're playing a role we're all playing a role admittedly but really it's up to us men to to drive the uh, to push things forward to drive the narrative so to speak and with good reason this is purely a biological force and biological factors which are pretty which determine the way the sexual relationships uh, manifest i mean for example we as men are visual creatures we are stimulated by you know visual stimuli you know how a girl works how hot she is how she dresses how she moves how she how she speaks it doesn't matter as much it probably it does i mean as, as things move forward but you know those you know non non-verbal cues as they're known right these things do play a, a very significant part and, and we men respond to it okay needless to say our arousal systems are much different I mean, we get turned on pretty quickly pretty easily uh, not too easily it has to be said i mean but, but the point remains that you know these factors do play a part and that in turn pushes us to take action to approach a girl to speak to her to move things forward to make her feel comfortable to to generate that trust, to generate a sense of, uh, you know, uh, respect, you know, because respect is a pretty variable. I think there's, there's a point there. A girl will sleep with you if she respects you, okay? She may like you, but, you know, liking you is not necessarily a guarantee that she would, you know, get it on. But if she respects you and she thinks of you as high value, then the chances are higher, which is, of course, why we men, you know, seek, uh, seek value. We seek to produce value. We seek to work, you know, grow our careers, build ourselves, mm -hmm. build our physique, you know, be more articulate, you know, all these things, you know, have a social network. It's all about ultimately, I mean, I won't say ultimately, but at a key, at, at a key level, it's about, you know, getting uh, in more eloquent terms about winning fair ladies' heart, okay? It's about getting the girl, so to speak. And that is important for us to consider. Now, why am I saying this? Okay, this is just a, you know, sort of a quick mop up of what's really going on, okay? How the dynamics work, how the relationship landscape, so to speak, operates, okay? These are the rules we should be, have to follow, whether we like it or not, okay? If you're a guy, and if you want to, you know, not just get laid, but really, you know, get a girl to like you, get a girl to want you, get a girl to desire you, you need to be able to hit these markers. Okay? You need to be able to hit, you know, value, proposition, physical, fitness, health, to some extent, to a great extent. You know, you need to be knowledgeable. You need to be articulate. You need to be, you know, and, for the, and critically, guys, you need to be desired by other women. I think the social factors, uh, you know, do contribute to this. I mean, so it's like these, I mean, the rap videos, I think, hit the mark in some respects. It's like these old rap videos where a guy is, you know, surrounded by hot babes. And he's communicating that he's the he's the guy. And that's true, folks. I mean, for the record, I mean, a girl, if you're a guy and you're with other women, you know, the girl that you're interested in, she would, you know, more likely to respond positively. You know, you know, I, you know we've experienced that ourselves, right? It's like this. If you go for a girl and you're, you're just going for her, I think I, think I mentioned this, I mentioned this. Yeah, if you're a guy and you're just going for one girl, okay, just her, you know, it, it's a hit or miss, right? It may or may not work, at least it may not work out immediately. But if you're hitting on 510 and you're, you're three or four, you know, coming through or whatever, I mean, I don't mean that it's dismissive. This is how things work in life, right? I mean, because nothing is a given. You know, then you know you have a, you have a broad uh, spectrum, and and the one that you do want, you know, may or may not fall through. The chances go up higher, okay. And there's something called social selection. So I don't want to get into the whole, you know, social biological, social biological factors that correspond to dating. But the point remains, for men, it is a process. It is a challenge. It is one that, which involves effort and uh, trial. It's a trial and error process, really, and it's one which entails growth. And critically, critically, one that pertains to success. Okay, success is a key variable. Okay. If you're a guy who wants to get good with girls, period, you need to do well. If, yeah, this goes back to you know high school days when the popular guy or the guy who's the you know the sportsman or the prefect or the uh, I think the quarterback ex analogy. You know that it, it, it's true. That, that this worked pretty well. Those examples are pertinent, and it's true. I mean, we can go for men with high social status, men who stand out, men who are likable, tough, progressive leaders, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is true throughout history. There's no you know there's no way around this. So. Now, considering all of this, considering these factors and forces, considering these realities, okay, that determine the, the relationship game, the dating game, and, and the sex game, and it is a game, and when I say game, it's not, you know, a game in a funky sense, but it's a game in a competitive sense, okay, it's not a game in a, in a sort of a, in a stupid way, but it's a serious game, it's, it's a competitive struggle in some ways, it's Darwinian at some level, not in a crude uh, live or die scenario, that could be the case as well. But it is a very real thing. Now, for us men, given these uh, state of affairs, okay, we have to play it carefully. We need to deal with this uh, honestly. Okay, And it seems to me, and okay, this is the point I'm getting at here, a lot of these Christian groups, a lot of these Christian teachers, a lot of these Christian moralists and whatever, people who are in the space teaching people how to be ethical, how to be good, how to be moral, how to be pure, how to be virginal, especially for men, where this chastity version thing is thrown up all the time, they seem to be either ignorant or dismissive or both as far as these social biological dynamics are concerned. Okay? They're not really considering the evolutionary basis for dating and relationships. They're not considering uh, the competitive structure, okay? Why men with high status tend to attract women. They don't consider why men who have power are able to get women to like them and desire them. They don't, they don't get the idea that why men who are successful, like right? you know, sports stars, celebrities, uh, you know, you know, IT entrepreneurs, I don't know, maybe even politicians. And politicians, that's true as well. Folks like, you know, JF Kennedy and I guess maybe even President Trump uh, during his time. <laughs> you know, these guys do get a lot of 
right? And again, I don't mean that in a negative way, folks. It's just how things are. And women themselves are, are wired in that way because women, you know, pursue men with high status. In fact, now recently, this whole business of uh, what you call hypergamy, right? Women who want to date upwards and women who want to pursue men who are, who are doing well in life. I mean, these things are real consideration, folks. I mean, we, we cannot, you know, turn a blind eye to them, okay? And it's seen in the Christian world, in the Christian framework, people are sort of, you know, oblivious to this. They're just solely ignorant of these realities. Like everything is like, you know, you know, fairy tale, you know, boy meets girl, you know, Prince Charming who's going to come your way and he's going to marry you and have, you know, take your virginity when you're on your marriage bed sort of thing. And for guys, you know, what does that imply to us? What does it tell us? Okay, what kind of incentive structure are we supposed to follow or pursue? Okay, because if you try to be Prince Charming and try to, you know, wait for that one girl or pursue that one girl, I mean, the whole thing is incongruent, is it not? I, I may have mentioned this already, but, you know, relationships are a learning curve. It's a, it's, a, it's a process, okay? You get better every time you do it, okay? From your first date to the second date to the third date, from your first kiss to the third kiss and whatnot, and from the first time you get busy to the third time and later. I mean, you get my difference. The, the idea of reference experience, okay? It's critical, okay? You learn by doing, you learn by experiencing, okay? You learn by, you know, putting in, putting in the hard yard, so to speak. And without it, you're not going to make it, okay? You're not going to attain it. And it seems for these Christian people, you know, the people, the chastity, virginity people, everything has to be like sort of purely set. Everything's like a set place. And life doesn't work that way. I mean, the complexity of human relationships, when it comes to the real world, I mean, I guess it's different in a, in a church context, in, a, in a, some Christian youth group or whatnot. Okay, if you, I guess you meet your partner there, it wouldn't make much of a difference. But really, though, the way the world works in, in terms of relationship is, is competitive. It's a struggle. Okay, it's not it's not fair. It's not easy. And and in the win, it's, it's almost like a winner takes all scenario. Okay, in times gone by, like let's say during the time of King Khan or whatnot, you know, the winner literally takes all. Right. This is this is why these guys were like impregnating, impregnating hundreds of women and killing all the men. But but the point is that. The, these dynamics still are in play. They still are operative at our level as well. So when it comes to this whole chastity virginity thing, it seems to me the guys who are teaching these things, the people who are in this space trying to promote these narratives, okay, they're not considering the reality of life, the ugliness of life, okay, how brutal it can be. And I mean that in a, in sort of a metaphorical sense because it's not brutal, people don't get killed. But, but the point is, listen, that is how it is, okay. And it, the, the whole chastity virginity argument, they're just being ignorant of it. So that is something for us to consider, okay, why are these people who are talking about, you know, all these relationships, you know, the morality, ethics, and so on, not really paying attention to these other uh, factors, okay? Uh, hypergamy, as I mentioned, you know, status, uh, the role of economic, uh, you know, being being able to command resources, being, uh, you know, being a recognized person, okay? For men, these factors are significant, okay? And if you push men in this direction, you know, you have to be chaste, you have to be virginal, whatever, whatever, and you're basically disempowering them. You can think about it, folks, okay? If you look at it this way, right? If you're a guy and you want to be good with the ladies, okay? You cannot be good with one girl. You can't just wait for one person, okay? You need to be, or one person, uh, you need to be good with women in general. You need to be able to attract women uh, across the board, okay? And it's not just about, you know, getting them to be your girlfriend or whatever, or even to sleep with you, but it's about being desirable. It's about being appealing, okay? It's a bit like, I don't know, someone like, I don't know, uh, I mean, let me think of a famous person. Who's a, who's a famous guy? I don't know, Bruno Mars, like some famous singer, okay? Or, uh, I don't know, maybe maybe DiCaprio. DiCaprio's in his, almost his, in his late 40s now, right? Now, he he, he gets the girls, let's say, right? You know, he, he doesn't date girls who are less than 25 or something, right? <laughs> well, older than 25, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, point is, listener, that there are the, there are certain rules to the way the world way the world works, and I think the, the Christian worldview doesn't seem to consider them. It doesn't seem to be aware of them. They don't seem to uh, pay adequate attention to these realities. Okay, so to, as an example, okay, let's just say a guy. Okay, if you you know set yourself out to just wait for the one person, one one girl, okay, to get her into your life. You're going to lose out in the in the experience. You're going to lose out in the developmental stage. You're going to lose out in terms of how you grow as a person. Okay, you're not going to be able to go out and meet people and uh, develop relationships. Okay, uh, communicate, articulate, compete. Oh, because I mean, if you, let's say you go out on a night, you know, that you see a girl you want to talk to. Okay, there'll be other guys sitting on her. Okay, how do you navigate that? How do you you know get past that? Okay, let's say a girl's with you for a moment and she's with someone else, talking to someone else, and how do you break through that? Or how do you you know move from that psychologically and shift to the other person? Okay, I mean, this is how the world is, folks. I mean, it's not a you know simple model of you know good guy good girl meets you know both of them are virgins they meet and they're happy together and they lose their virginity together together and they live happily ever after okay that's not how the world works and for men this is especially problematic for these kinds of teachings to, to be articulated because it it creates false incentives it creates uh, this sort of a fake fairy tale like world where everything is perfect and good when when it's not okay women seek status women seek men with power women seek men who have high authority okay and if you're a guy trying to be good and holy and virginal and try to protect a girl's virginity you know she she's gonna you know i mean frankly at worst she's gonna cheat on you 
Okay, she's going to find a guy who has higher status, higher value. She's going to open up to him. And this is an important point, listen. I mean, uh, this is not a fashionable thing to say, but you know, women are more sexually receptive to men with authority, okay? Men who are able to communicate value, who are aggressive, who are tough, not in an abusive way, and they will open up to them. And in fact, they might play the good girl virgin card to the nice guy, the guy who's, you know, looking for a long-term partner. He's going to get, you know, friend-zoned or, you know, he'll be given a cold shoulder or maybe rejected outright because she's not an into him, okay? And she'll be playing, oh, we need to wait till we get married card <laughs> to him. And then for the rich guy or the powerful guy or the attractive guy or the, the socially assertive guy, she'll be banging the guy to the night. I mean, that's how the world is, folks. I mean, we need to sort of be real about this. I think the chastity of virginity, especially with men, is problematic, okay? Uh, the competitive dynamics of relationships, the competitive character of, uh, of sex, okay? How women choose partners, how men have to compete against other men, okay? How the importance of reference experiences, okay? The whole chastity of virginity thing is so simplistic. It's so morally simplistic, okay? It's so uh, functionally simplistic. It doesn't consider other variables, okay? And this is a problem. So, folks, I don't want to speak too much on this. This is a huge subject matter, and I'll you know, develop this further going forward. But I just want to throw this out there. The whole idea of why men are chased, okay? The reason why men are chased, I guess, in the Christian world is that they don't have status, okay? They're not, they're not desired. They're not athletic. They're not, they don't have a social following, okay? They're not leaders, okay? You know, they don't have the power to command respect, hence the attention of women, okay? So really, their chastity is a function of their inability to succeed, their inability to uh, achieve great things in life, okay? I mean, let's face it, if you're, you know, some, you know, basketball player at the NBA or you're some tech entrepreneur uh, from, you know, from Silicon Valley or wherever, you're not going to have much trouble you know, getting the girls. I mean, of course, you need to know, you know how to move socially. You need to have the game, so to speak. It's a step by step process. But the point is, listen, you know, that's not going to happen if you're committed to a chaste way of life. Okay, you're basically crippling yourself in the process, waiting for you know some virgin girl to like you and love you. It's never going to happen, as far as I'm concerned. It could happen, I mean, but realistically, looking at the social aggregate, it's it's a bad bet. And 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 paradoxically, folks, it seems like the people who are drawn to these teachings, like this is a serious point. Okay. Are men who are not able to succeed, men who are not able to achieve and attain things, men who are, you know, basically, you know, content with leading a mediocre life, and then, you know, they'll just hope for one single girl to come their way and, you know, like them and marry them. So this is really a, you know, dumb strategy. And I, and I, there are people who have been talking about this. I have noticed um, some people in the space. I think I know who that person is. There are a few people actually who are trying to promote these Christian ethical dating, but they themselves have a lot of problems. So I'll probably get into this as well. So far, I've kept. It, I've not tried to get too personal on this. I might, I may do so going forward. This is a serious matter, folks. I mean, in the name of helping men, you know, lead a good dating life to be a good person, whatever, they're undermining men, okay? Because for men, like, it's life is about success. Okay? You need to move forward, you need to rise about things. And and success with women is a crit critical variable. Now, whether that's ethical or not, in the moral sense, that's secondary. Because that's, that's basically, folks, everyone's going to make mistakes. And you be you're better off learning by growing, learning by doing, learning by making mistakes than just, you know, trying to be ethical and chase. And really, to be honest with you, a lot of these chastity guys or chase guys, at the end, are just losers, okay? They just don't have it. They don't, they don't, they don't know how to have They don't know how to get it, okay? Uh, they're out of it, essentially, and that is really uh, what's going on here. So this is a bit cynical, folks. This is a bit critical. I know I'm not being uh, that nice, uh, but this is something for us to consider. This whole chastity version of thing seems like a, an attempt to disempower men. It's about creating false incentives. It's about cre creating this false notion of reality which does not exist. I mean, just look at Tinder, folks. I mean, unfortunately, men to men is much higher, and girls have a huge selection of guys with good reason. Okay, they'll only pick the best one, and 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 good and good for them. Okay. Uh, you know, women have no problem attracting men. Let's face it. I mean, no matter what you hear about these stuff about you know, girls having struggles, you know, finding a guy, what girls want is a good guy. They want a powerful guy. They want a rich guy. Okay, they want a guy who can dominate uh, the opposition. They are the ones they're waiting for. It's a bit like lions. You know, you know, the male lions, they're, they're fighters. They have to fight, kill, and survive. And the most powerful ones will reproduce. It's social Darwinian. It's not a fair thing. It's not a nice thing. But that's how the world is. So all these Christian guys waiting for you know, you know, the virgin bride to be by being chased. You're just going walking the path of a loser. It's hard to say, it, but that's what it is. But there are exceptions, of course. All right, folks, this is a Christian humanist. I'm Damien. Uh, this is the problem with uh, chastity for men or men who pursue chastity or chase, who choose to be chaste, whatever. I uh, hope you like it. See you guys next time.